Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Courage to Act National Skillshare series. It's our last community of practice today, and I'm so excited to be a part of this conversation with all of you. We're just going to give it one more minute before we start. Um, so get in a comfortable position, get some water, get whatever is going to feel good for you in this moment. All right, I think we are good to start. So um, again, my name is Farah Khan and I'm one of the co-directors of Courage to Act, which is a national project to look at addressing and preventing gender-based violence. And I am so excited to be here because this is our Skillshare suggestion today is something near and dear to me as a frontline gender-based violence worker, because we're going to be listening and hearing about this amazing project that frontline gender-based violence workers created in their community of practice. Before we begin, um, a note about accessibility and language. Attendees can view live captions for this session by clicking the link in the chat box. So just look down the chat box and you can see it. And you can also listen to the session in French by selecting French language channel using the interpretation menu. Today's session is being recorded and will be available on our website along with a transcript of this session. A graphic recording will also be created today's presentation by Sam from Drawing Change. We're so lucky to be here with him. Um, his role is to listen deeply and translate our ideas into visuals. You can watch Sam drawing as he follows along with the session by spotlighting his video in your Zoom setting. There'll be a graphic recording available at all the Skillshare sessions, which you can find in the education tab on our website. And when they are released as a part of the community of practice tools in the Kershack Knowledge Center, which will be happening very soon. Courage Act is a two-year national initiative to address and prevent gender-based violence on post-secondary institutions in Canada. It builds on key recommendations within the Possibility Seeds Vital Report, Courage Act, developing a national framework to address and prevent gender-based violence at post-secondary institutions. Our project is the first national collaboration of its kind that brings together scholars, experts, advocates from across Canada to end gender-based violence on campus. Now, that's a pretty lofty goal, so I can say we're really working on preventing it or even addressing it because it is a huge issue and we can't just do it in a silo. About the National Skillshare, so a key feature of our project is a National Skillshare series where working groups, communities of practice, and keynote speakers will discuss tools, trends, and strategies that will shape how we address and prevent gender-based violence on campus. Through the Skillshare series, we're so pleased to introduce and offer insights into development of the tools and resources created by gender-based violence experts like yourselves. There will be a chance to sign up for piloting opportunities at the Courage Shack Knowledge Center in fall 2021. And it's really exciting. We'll be able to spend time with you actually looking at these tools and refining them together. Attendees who join a connect, join, attendees who will join a connected network of experts and advocates across Canada who explore urgent issues and promising practices. This is supported by Caucus. These skill search series are also recognized learning opportunity. Attendance at 10 or more live webinars in our national skill share series will count towards an online certificate. A project is made possible by the generous support and funding for the, from the Department of Women and Gender Equality, WAGE, Federal Government of Canada. Possibility Seeds always begins our sessions with the recognition that we're acknowledging this work is taking place on and across traditional territories of many Indigenous communities. We recognize that, that gender-based violence is one form of violence caused by colonization to marginalize and dispossess Indigenous people from their lands and waters. The frontline worker team will be providing outland acknowledgement as part of their presentation. If you don't know what community that you are as a settler on, it's really important to, to figure that out. And you can go to nativeland.ca and that's a really important place you can find that and explore what that looks like for you and what that means for you. I also wanna name that this work is challenging. Many of us have been working now for a year under pandemic restrictions. We may be survivors, we may be a frontline worker, wherever we're at on the, that spectrum, it's really important that we take care of ourselves. And I hear you that it's hard. And so we do have a self-care section on our website that you can go, we call it shelf care, and you can go and kind of explore things that feel good for you. If it feels overwhelming right now, you can go to that. You can also use the hashtag GBV National Skillshare to talk about anything you're learning today that you're excited about. Please share it so people know about it. You're invited to enter 
uh, enter questions in the Q&A box throughout the session. They will be posed to the frontline GBV, GB, GBV workers CP at the end of the presentation. We'll try to engage with as many questions as we can. Please do ask them. At the end of this hour, you'll also find an evaluation link. We're grateful if you take a few minutes to share your feedback as it helps us improve. It's anonymous, so we're not going to know who did it or shared it. So please tell us what you think. Following the sessions, we'll also email you a copy of the evaluation form and a link to the recordings you can view it again and share with your networks. I'm so excited to introduce Megan Ross um, from the GBV Community of Practice. Megan and I have worked together for a number of years and somebody I really appreciate and trust. Um, and she is a sexual violence response coordinator at University of Waterloo. Today, she'll be the facilitator for the Frontline GBV Workers Campus Skillshare. Thanks, Farah, and thanks so much for having us here. Um, we're really excited to be able to connect with everyone today and to talk about the work that we've been doing collectively together. Um, so as we, as we begin, we really do want to take that time to center and focus on the land that we're on and what that means for us. And so as Farah mentioned, we are all treaty people. And what that means is that there have been traditional and current custodians of these lands and waters across Turtle Island. Island. Um, and those Indigenous people doing that work have done that since time immemorial. And we have a lot to learn from them. Those of us who are settlers have a lot to learn from them in terms of their teachings and particularly what that means for work in education and what that means for work against gender-based violence. And so today we want to start by taking time to think what our role is. What does an actual land acknowledgement mean? Um, and those of us who who are settlers, especially those of us who are white, those of us who did not come here through forced enslavement um, or forced migration, we have a role in being uh, allies and being in the struggle and being in the resistance with Indigenous folks. Um, taking their direction and their lead. Um, this is particularly true as um, it is really, this is a heavy time for us and for you. And there's a lot on our hearts when we think about what is happening in terms of colonialism across Turtle Island. And as we think about what's happening in terms of colonialism globally. So there is much work for us to do. And we would encourage folks to take a moment right now to think how we individually and we collectively do this work of moving from just an acknowledgement into action. So we encourage folks to take that pause first before we start this conversation and to be in a good mind and a good space and a good heart and to think about how we incorporate the teachings um, that we have learned from Indigenous peoples and that they continue to share with us. So we encourage folks to, to take a moment right now and to think about how we move into action and what, what are we called to do. Thanks for taking that moment with us. Um, this is really central to, as far as said, um, the conversations that we have doing this work around addressing colonialism, around addressing um, how education should happen, uh, around addressing gender-based violence. These are all hard conversations and central to our work. And one of the benefits of having worked in a community of practice together is that we have been able to reduce some of our isolation, that we have been able to think creatively with each each other, to strategize, um, and to really provide that support to each other. You will hear later on today sort of how varied the context of the work that we do are, um, that we each kind of um, are structured in a, in a campus that looks really different, that comes to this work from with different agendas. And many of us come from community or are currently in community and being called in to do this work on campuses. And from all of that um, isolation, we have been able to use our community practice to create a tool that, that is really born of thinking about what this work could look like and thinking about what we need to do this work well. 
So I'd like to invite Carla from the Community of Practice. Carla is the Sexual Violence Support Advocate from the University of Calgary. And Carla is going to first take us through the tool, so let you know what the tool includes, how it was developed, how it came to be, what we're hoping it can do. And then we're going to speak with some of the other folks from the Community of Practice who um, are going to help us think about its applicability and its uh, the tool's adaptability. So welcome to Carla. Uh, thank you, Megan. Thank you for that intro. Uh, I'm just going to dive into it here and um, bring you kind of up to speed in where we are and the work that we've done in creating this evaluation tool. So most of us uh, probably on this call are aware that these roles are still pretty new on campus and there's very little thorough or consistent evaluation frameworks in place that help us demonstrate the value of the work that we do beyond just collecting numbers um, around people that we respond to or that are seeking support. Uh, or making complaints. And so while there may be some legislation governing reporting numbers of people served, this is not the whole story. Um, there hasn't been time for us to answer all the complex questions that really evaluate the work that we're doing. So this is um, when we talk about the less visible or invisible pieces, uh, this is what kind of centered a lot of our conversation. And we wanted to think about how do we um, kind of take into account that work that's being done? How do we measure the value of supporting survivors when this work is often invisible, uh, it's new to institutions, and the benefits might, might not be as easily quantifiable as simply adding numbers. So for example, maybe who, how many people remained in school as a result of the services provided. These roles were created from student advocacy um, and require some really unique ways of supporting people and thinking outside of the box, recognizing pro this problem as being gendered and therefore a matter of human rights. And so really meeting people individually, uniquely, every time that we sit down with folks um, and meeting them where they're at. So for us, that means being really well educated in most, if not all areas of anti-oppression work, things like racism, homophobia, transphobia, phobia, ableism, sexism, xenophobia, xenophobia, sorry, uh, and how these pieces interact with each other, such as things like misogynoir, um, as well as systems theories, thinking critical race theory, queer theory. Um, so thinking about things there like patriarchy and colonialism, as well as strong understandings of multiple reporting processes um, and institutional systems like the criminal system, the healthcare system, education systems, civil processes, human rights processes, occupational health, professional college complaints. Um, and this is not an exhaustive list. And we, we also must be able to do all of this while doing it in a trauma informed way. Um, so we needed a tool that was dynamic, something that could be both flexible to our unique um, post-secondaries and the context of those that we're in, but as well that could help create something comparative across institutions and, pro and provinces. Um, we need to be able to demonstrate the skills and expertise, um, kind of uh, the knowledge foundational to this work that I was mentioning above, um, most of which comes from our work and connections to feminist anti-violence work within communities. We need to be able to show partners and governments um, and our boards the data in ways that help them understand the full picture. This felt like a really daunting task and we had many, many conversations um, about how we might do this. Many frontline workers um, in different campuses have made great strides in developing their programs to ensure supports in, are in place, um, but we haven't had the time to maybe pause, reflect and develop evaluation for assessing this work. Uh, so this tool is hopefully going to help us all do that and strengthen our um, responses to sexual violence on our campuses, making sure they're effective and, and impactful. Um, we would like to dedicate this tool to all of the people who have come forward to share their stories and knowledge, allowing us to walk with you uh, during such a difficult time. Thank you for your courage in seeking support, and we hope that we have accurately represented your knowledge. So let me share a little bit about the toolkit and the process arrived um, where we are now. So this community uh, work took shape in perfect community development process. We met several times talking as a group, sharing knowledge, experiences, and building trust through listening and reciprocity. Uh, we had an amazing consultant, Anna, work with us who spent time listening, asking questions, building a framework, and continually checking in with us to make sure the needs of the assessment was just right so that we could best represent the work and the voices of those we support. Uh, we brought together um, frontline workers from across Canada at different PSIs um, connected to this work as well as some community organizations that support this work. So we acknowledge that this work dedicates some attention to staff and faculty, but the evaluation framework intentionally focuses on students primarily, 
for a couple of reasons. Um, students are the largest population on most of our campus, as well as the largest population that most of us serve in general. Um, and many folks on different campuses actually only work with, with students. And secondly, students are overrepresented, unfortunately, in um, sexual violence statistics, gender-based violence statistics. So in general, these um, positions have leadership or crucial involvement at, um, addressing PS uh, gender-based violence at post-secondaries. Uh, to describe these areas, we adopted here the key dimensions suggested by the Courage to Act report. One, that we respond to disclosures and provide support. Two, that we provide uh, prevention education. And three, we provide support reporting, um, investigation work and adjudication. However, the scope of this evaluation framework is specifically for the assessment of institutional response and disclosures and support of survivors, um, victims or survivors. We decided not to include the assessment of prevention and education since these domains require a separate evaluation framework. The purpose of this framework is fundamentally to improve existing response and support services. Um, so I'm gonna just talk a little bit next about why it's important to capture this work and the benefit of doing that. So we hope that this resource, uh, resource sorry, can help frontline workers adopt a, an evidence-based approach to inform local program improvement uh, and advocacy initiatives and reporting. The community practice highlighted that monitoring evaluation purposes should go beyond the purpose of just being accountable to funders. We wanted to develop a tool that got with guidelines to collect and analyze data that would be helpful to also uh, improve programs and services and to collectively learn together across all the PSIs in Canada so that we could speed up this learning process. Because what we also know um, is that as we're learning and, and maybe making mistakes, um, we're causing more harm. So if we can do this collectively together and learn from each other, um, that would be best. So these guidelines were developed to help frontline workers and their teams create a, a monitoring and evaluation framework at your own PSI with the following purposes. To understand the efforts and deliverables attached to institutional responses to disclosures and support services by assessing outputs. To study the direct effects and impacts of the work um, on the response system and the services offered to victims and survivors by assessing outcomes. To understand uh, what frontline or sorry, what GBV victims or survivors found challenging or helpful when they access the supports related to our work at PSIs and to buy, provide recommendations for future directions. So I'd like to share a little bit about what the, you can expect to see in the tool um, next. So our tool contains one main document with guidelines on how to develop an evaluation framework. Uh, it also includes two annexes and one simulation document. Uh, we want to thank Zanab from Courage to Act um, as they developed the simulation tool for us. And it was kind of something we did last minute as we realized it would be really helpful in um, understanding the tool and putting it into taking that theory to practice. So they created a narrative with a fake post-secondary to test this frontline GBV work um, and analyze the data. So you'll be able to see that um, to help provide guidance. We believe that the guidelines built collectively with this group um, can help develop and implement structured monitoring and evaluation processes focused on the work related to response and disclosures. So I'm just going to outline the, um, the, basic, the six steps of the framework to help uh, give you a bit of an insight into what to expect. So there are six uh, steps you can see on the screen. The first section will help you make some informed choices to define the foundations, identify and define multiple components such as what key stakeholders should be involved and to what extent should they be engaged? Um, what are your data collection capabilities? Uh, the framework purposes, scope and timeframe, and then timeframes for developing and implementing uh, this framework. This section provides tips on how to start discussions at your PSI, um, questions such as who should be involved and how, what skills do we need to build? What will be the approach? What resources available? What form of evaluation is best for us to use? So although having some insights on stakeholder engagement and scope alignment, um, step two, which is building the foundations, is really a pro provides a meaningful contribution uh, to how and why we build a program theory and we offer a program logic model uh, that can be utilized at your different programs. There are diagrams and examples that can be utilized as a starting point. Step three, choosing evaluation questions, provides examples 
of evaluation questions in four different evaluation domains. So the first one is appropriateness. So looking at to what extent is the work being done at your school appropriate to the needs of people um, affected or impacted by gender-based violence? Two is efficiency. To what extent were the intended outputs delivered? And were the available res resources sufficient to do this well? Uh, effectiveness, to what degree was the program considered as being a value by its key stakeholders? And last is impact. To what degree and extent did the work achieve its intended objectives and desired changes? Uh, step four is creating an integrating modern, uh, sorry, the integrated monitoring and evaluation plan. So this is organized according to the evaluation dimension domains I just mentioned. Monitoring indicators are suggested to provide data about, about the program and evaluation met methods to answer each of the evaluation questions to provide a deep analysis and possible inferences from that uh, data that you collect. Uh, step five, collecting and working with data. During the discussions with, um, that informed these guidelines, we talked about the importance of having data <clears throat> that is comparable across um, our organizations and different PSIs. So this is where we, we would refer readers to those two annexes I was telling you about that were created to help uh, ease an understanding of the tool. The first one is the indicator information section or annex one, and it describes each of the indicators listed in our monitoring and evaluation plan in more detail, also expanding uh, upon how to measure them. So they are organized again, according to the four evaluation domains, which were appropriateness, uh, efficiency, effectiveness, and impact. The second tool or annex two, uh, compendium of data collection tools provides suggestions for the creation or adjustments of tools that maybe you're already using to collect the data to be evaluated. So the ones that we've included are um, an intake form, tools for assessment of gender-based violence policies on your campus, follow-up forms to be completed by victims or survivors who have um, access services, and statistics collection tool uh, completed by the gender-based violent worker after meeting with a victor, victim or survivor. So these four tools will give us access for different um, data point collection pieces. Uh, there's also a priority in identification tool for frontline gender-based violence workers, which offers gender-based violence workers a list of suggested areas to discuss with um, the institution and managers to support identification priorities to address our own trauma exposure. And then finally, um, step, step six is sharing your findings. And this just presents a rough draft of an annual report that could be used to present the data that you've been now collecting using this tool. And it could be adjusted according to the context of each PSI or post-secondary. Um, knowing that not all institutions uh, are the same and have are different places of this work, uh, maybe have different expectations of what they're monitoring and evaluating, we opt opted to offer a really comprehensive tool so that each PSI could choose what was uh, applicable to its own uh, context. So kind of lastly, the tool presents um, some guidelines that are ready to be piloted. And this means that as we re receive feedback, uh, we can implement these experiences to continue to improve it. So that's kind of the tool, um, a high level example of the tool, and I'm gonna pass it back to Megan. Thank you so much for that. Um, I hope that was helpful for folks. It's We know you haven't seen it, so we wanted to spend some time kind of outlining what it included. So um, that's a little bit of like rapid fire information about everything that would be involved. Um, as you sort of hear from us um, today and as we continue talking, please do populate any questions you have about what's involved or any of the specifics that Carla mentioned. Now I'd like to welcome four other folks from the community of practice who are going to help us think through how this can be really adapted, how this tool reflects the different contexts in which we're working. Um, so first I'd invite Megan Simon. Um, she's the Sexual Violence Response Coordinator at McEwen University in Edmonton. Um, then I'd like to have Eileen uh, Conroy come on. Eileen, she's the Sexual Violence Prevention and Response Coordinator at the University of Prince Edward Island. Um, we'll also also have Colleen. Colleen is the Director of Mental Health and Wellness at UConn University. And Paula, um, Paula, she's the Executive Director at the Cornerbrook Status of Women Council, which is in um, Cornerbrook, Newfoundland and Labrador. So if all of those folks want to join me. Great. I'm just ensure. So we have Colleen. That's great. Okay. 
So first, what I'm hoping that we can do is just have um, some information from each of you um, to let us know a little bit about your specific context, help us to think about how your um, PSI or your community organization kind of enters into this work. Um, and then tell us a little bit about how you think the tool could be adapted to your context. And I'm just going to call on folks for the ease of today. So I'll just start kind of in the order that people um, were sort of announced or introduced. So Megan, if you could start just by sharing some information about your context and how you think this tool is really going to be applicable into, into your space and the work that you're doing. Sounds good. Thank you, Megan. Uh, so as the other Megan said, I am at McEwen University. We're located in Treaty 6 territory in Edmonton, Alberta. We are a downtown campus with roughly 18,500 students, part-time and full-time. Uh, McEwen University offers a mix of bachelor programs, transfer degree programs, as well as diploma and certificate programs. Uh, we introduced a sexual violence policy in 2015, and then my position as sexual violence response coordinator was created in 2018. So in terms of how I see this framework applying to my particular context, I think the reality that has already been mentioned is that these positions have been created within the last, I would say maybe five to 10 years for the most part. And all of us faced situations where we were coming into the position and needed to create it from the ground up. And I spent quite a bit of time early on uh, deciding what kind of structure I needed for the position, what would be my particular role at the university, my responsibilities, and overall how I fit into the university ecosystem, knowing that there were other support services available, and so what would be my unique role. And one of my first priorities was, was needing to create uh, myself an evaluation tool, a tool to track my service delivery and a way to draft annual reports for my stakeholders on campus. And specifically at McHugh and I have a sexual violence prevention education committee that I report to. So I, I relied quite heavily on my past experience working at not-for-profit sexual assault centers in Alberta and I was able to utilize that past experience to develop some tools, but they weren't developed um, necessarily from a context that this framework was developed where we were all gender-based violence workers working together to say, what do we need to evaluate from within a post-secondary environment? So I think the tool is gonna to be very helpful in me thinking through how I've been evaluating and improving how I evaluate into the future to ensure that I'm, I'm looking at the, the context that I'm working within rather than um, relying on previous experience and previous tools. And I think all of the indicators are gonna be applicable to my context. So I'm very excited to use it um, and for both evaluating my services as well as uh, uh, reporting mechanisms as well. Thanks. I, I hear you and feel the like having to have built things from the ground up. So I feel that resonating and I'm, I think that's probably true for lots of folks who are in, in the kind of work that we're doing. Eileen. Hi from PEI. Um, so yes, I am at the University of Prince Edward Island. Um, just some context again, our population here, around 160,000. I think we might have just gone over that recently. Um, my university has about 4,000 students. I think I incorrectly put the number of staff and faculty that we had on that um, slide before, but we have about 800 staff and faculty, largely a commuter campus. Um, and yeah, we launched our sexual violence policy here in October 2018. At that time, I was hired as the first coordinator as well. Um, so I'm the only coordinator responsible for both response and prevention education on campus, uh, supporting every member of the university community, all instances of sexualized violence, no matter when or where. Um, we do actually have uh, sexual violence policy legislation here on PEI, uh, but our reporting requirements are unspecified at this time, uh, not in our regulation. And I think the personal context matters as much as the university context. So like Megan was saying, uh, um, Megan number two, I should say, <laughs> um, I have a background in nonprofit. I have a master's in educational counseling. And so I, I came from working directly with survivors in counseling. And now I'm here at this university navigating processes and wearing many different hats. Um, so I think I'm interested in many of the indicators that are included in this tool. 
Um, I love that there are measures for quantity that speaks to stakeholders who respond to that, but then also that we're going to be looking at the quality of people's response experiences using my services. Um, I also like to think about how you know, it is adaptable and that I can pick and choose indicators as my own role evolves. And maybe kind of, like, uh, I think Megan was saying, it, you know, potentially meet that those dream services that we want to have on campuses uh, across the country. Um, but there are a few indicators that I may not use. So for example, in my current context right now, um, I don't have a survivor accompaniment in the scope of my at this moment. I also don't have third party reporting under my policy. So those might be things that I might not include in, in a measure for my university context. I'm also very mindful and want to be mindful about what information I take um, and for what reason. Because of my small school size, I have to be mindful about what information might be um, identifying when I'm reporting um, certain measures for my office. Um, I also really like the stakeholder mapping matrix because like I said, I am one person in this office. I think it's going to be really helpful to not only help me to identify the um, stakeholders on campus and the community, but also the level of engagement that um, I might need for them or might be expected from them. Um, and I think sometimes a tool is a great way to communicate um, and build relationships on campus. So I'm, I'm foreseeing that being really helpful as well. Thanks. Thanks for all that um, information about how you can kind of see that that moving moving that tool throughout your space and the work that you're doing, particularly as one person um, in a smaller context. Thanks for that. Um, Colleen. Thank you, Megan. So I'm from Yukon University and Yukon University is the only post-secondary institution in the Yukon Territory. The Ayandigut campus uh, is in Whitehorse, and it's located on the traditional territory of the Kwanlun Dan First Nation and Tan Gwich'in Council. And the Yukon actually has 14 individual First Nation governments, 11 of whom are self-governing. And we also have 13 campuses spread throughout the territory. So we're a large land mass with a small population. The city of Whitehorse itself has over 30,000 people, the population of the entire territory is just over 42,000. So small numbers, um, but a, a great network of post-secondaries throughout that territory. Yukon College became Yukon University in the spring of 2020. And we are the first Canadian university north of 60. So of course, we're a hybrid university offering a wide variety of programs that includes trades and indigenous governance is Yukon University's first degree. So there's a I guess a very diverse population throughout that, uh, that territory. The Yukon uh, University legislation does include specific commitments to Yukon First Nations, including their jurisdiction under the final and self-government agreements and the implementation of those agreements by building capacity through education and research for and with Yukon First Nations. So this is a really unique opportunity and legislated requirement to include all 14 First Nations in what we are doing. So when it comes to uh, you know, sexualized and gender-based violence, it's really an important opportunity, but a, a huge challenge to, um, to figure out how to do that. So in terms of the tool, uh, we do have an SVRP policy that was approved in 2018. The legislation from 2020 does name some specific requirements for Yukon U, including identifying reporting procedures. The territory itself uh, has a SVRP team, mainly based out of Whitehorse. Yukon University has a rep on this team. That person has been on leave, so we have not had a, a current rep on there. And as a hybrid university, we're in a dynamic state of flux right now with many changes of staffing. Uh, so we, we don't have a, an office per se. So, in my role, I have ended up being one of those who has, uh, been, does my best to navigate those tough waters and, and uh, I guess, gain capacity and access uh, for the, the people who come forward and disclose and report. The tool provides strong guidelines from the student user lens, which is really exciting. And that can frame our changing infrastructure. 
the program theory and logic model easily fit all contexts. And I see it being a really exciting framework uh, to help guide all of the changes and the uh, decisions that need to be made at Yukon University around this. The data collection tools provide relevant indicators that can be chosen to fit the ongoing development and change in rules, both within Yukon U and the Yukon community. So the, I see huge value of this tool for our specific context. It has the option of guiding the creation of what I would consider an, an intentional, informed and integrated disclosure and support approach, both within Yukon University and the Yukon community. Because we are so small, we really do rely on one another to uh, have that expertise throughout the territory and really support one another within the context. Active participation in the visionary, hopeful potential and support of the higher education network cannot be overstated uh, in terms of, the, of its value for a place like the Yukon. And you know, being involved with the community of practice has been such uh, an incredible network and uh, I can, can't say enough about how important uh, the expertise and support from all of you has been and how you know, Yukon University looks forward to maintaining that and then continuing to be part of learning uh, together with everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and helpful, I think, to see the difference in terms of what legislation is all sort of governing people and, and, and the ways in which we are kind of coming to this work under different frameworks. Thanks for that, Colleen. Um, Paula. Hi, um, I am located in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, Labrador, on the west coast of the island portion of the uh, of the province. And Cornerbrook is located on the ancestral and traditional land of the Mi'kmaq and Beatuk people. Peoples. Um, Cornerbrook is a town of about 20,000 people, and it's located about eight hours away from the capital city, uh, which is our main major urban center for the entire province. Our town, although small, does have three post-secondary campuses. One is a university campus, campus, and then we have two college campuses. One is pi public and one is private, and we serve about 2,000 students. Um, as you might have guessed already, not all post-secondary institutes have dedicated staff to address sexual violence on campus, or the position might be shared between multiple campuses. Community agencies that are local often provide the service and support in these instances. So including community agencies in this community of practice reminds us that sexual violence often doesn't happen in isolation in our post-secondary institutions, often impacts all of the uh, community, and also that sexual and gender-based violence are societal issues. In terms of this tool, we see this tool as providing a basis for establishing a common foundation for establishing and evaluating services, regardless of who the provider is. Um, we also see it providing points for consideration for post-secondary institutions that have yet to develop these positions, but who are hoping to, and that they can use these uh, values and uh, points of, to consideration while they establish those positions. In terms of being a community-based organization, obviously our reporting processes will look different. However, what will remain the same is looking at those values of appropriateness, efficiency, effectiveness, and impact, because they're all relevant to the services and supports that we provide. Thanks so much. I really appreciate hearing um, from you, Paula. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to make sure that you were part of this panel is because um, we see this community of practice as uh, many of us have come in from community spaces and really are working to make those connections between folks in the community have, who have done this work long before universities came to this um, in order to sustain those partnerships and practices and to learn from, from each other. So I really appreciate um, that perspective of how you might make use of this in, in a space where there isn't someone um, in a role at a, at a particular university. Second question for you folks, and I'm just going to ask that you just share one thing. Um, what is, um, for each of you, what do you think is one of the values of the tool? And you've, you've kind of spoken to this a little bit, but I'm going to ask that folks be really specific and think about in the context of the work you're doing, um, the folks that you have to provide um, reports and data to, and the sort of multiplicity of who you would use this data for and with, um, what's one of the values? So real specific answer, I'm going to go back in the same order. Order, uh, Megan, Eileen, Colleen, Paula, Megan. 
I'm going to say two, but I'll be quick because I think that <laughs> there are two values. It's about accountability and making the invisible work visible. And I think for me personally, as somebody who's personally in this role, the accountability piece is maybe the most important. It's a way that I can be accountable to the people that I serve and my community in constantly looking at how to improve my service delivery. And I think that's so important. And then along with that, making the invisible work visible, it can be so difficult to reflect um, in even in words, in data, the work that we do, and often I summarize it as um, I help people leave feeling heard and feeling cared for and supported, but how do you reflect that in a reporting mechanism? So I think that this tool will be helpful in translating what support looks like in practice and what are the outcomes of that support. I didn't lie, that was super quick. Um, Eileen. Um, I want to uh, echo what Megan said, but also say um, because of, uh, you know, jumping into this role and starting a new office from scratch, um, it meant that I was guided by a lot of really great best practices that were already out there from other institutions and such, but I haven't had the the lived experience of the survivors to inform my practice. And so I'm really excited to be able to get feedback from the stakeholders involved in, in my services and being able to improve and um, continue to grow with the response that we have here on campus at UPI. Thanks. And I think that that accountability piece, as both of you were saying, is is really the foundation, right? That's the thing that we are focusing on the most for this work, recognizing that we report to lots of different folks. Um, Colleen. So I see it as being an incredible tool to create, I, I agree with the, you know, making the invisible visible. The accountability framework uh, has been absent, I think, in the Yukon and, and the university has really struggled with how do we do this? So I see this being super helpful to help us get on track to create a, an accountability framework that will work, that does pull that work out into numbers that people will understand. And appreciate the need to have, especially in spaces where there isn't a, a framework in place, really wanting to make sure that that is driven by the people who are most connected into this work. Um, those being the survivors and students and, and also ourselves who are, are doing this sort of frontline work. So making sure that that tool is kind of grounded in that perspective, I think is really important as you've alluded. Paula. Well, not to sound like a broken record, but obviously accountability, making the invisible visible. But I also think that this is a tool that allows us to establish improved partnerships between community organizations and post-secondary institutions that have similar goals. And that is in addressing gender-based violence in ways that improves individuals' health and well-being um, and helps them have better outcomes. Thanks. Um, so welcome folks to add in additional questions. We, we have um, two here that I'm going to start with. Um, so I'm hoping that folks can speak just a little bit about, and Megan, maybe I will start with you. Um, you had sort of mentioned, and Carla mentioned this earlier, that it's like really challenging to capture the work that we do um, for lots of reasons, but maybe you can just help explain like what is it that is so challenging to capture about our work and why has that not been sort of evident, the value of that work in previous evaluation methods before. I'm just going to give you the first answer off the top of my head, but you know we often talk about person-centered support and and you know what that looks like in practice and one of the ways that I might summarize person-centered support is like I'm a human and I recognize that the people I work with are humans and I'm building relationships with them and the relationships are the most important part and what are the foundations of relationships it's active listening it's caring for each other it's supporting each other it's um you know allowing people to make decisions for themselves respecting the dignity and self-determination of the people that we support and work with and and so how do you how do you reflect that in numbers when your focus is about cultivating relationships and i think one of there are many strengths of the tool and i think one of the strengths of the tool is that it has um, a follow-up survey and a way for the people that we work with, survivors and victims, and, and anybody else who we, we might be working with to, to, to communicate that in, in their own words. And also, you know, it's a mix of quantitative and qualitative um, methods that we're, we're using there. And so I, I might be rambling now and I have lost your question, but I hope that answers it. 
Um, I think that's capturing a, a lot of what we're trying to get at, that it that seems really hard to sort of put into just the numbers that we're most, uh, most often asked to report. Uh, Paula, Eileen, Colleen, anything you would add to answer to that, add to the answer of the question of what's challenging to capture about this work? Everyone, um, I think uh, just the, to reflect the complexity of the trauma that um, we're seeing, um, many survivors have a history of trauma, and that means, you know, that might not mean one visit to the office, that might mean a couple of phone calls and, you know, a soft way to enter into some support. And so it, it just, it really is challenging to paint the, the picture of, of, um, uh, of supporting these, these complex um, humans, like Megan said. Yeah, Paula. I think the other point to make too is that we're often seeing people in a moment, which is often in crisis. And what we do is often not quantifiable in that moment because the impact of what we're doing in establishing those relationships and providing support is often not seen until down the road. So I think that's the difficult part in kind of evaluating this type of work. Thanks, thanks for that. Colleen, did you wanna add anything in? Yeah, so the only other thing I would add is I think it's also the complexity and the discomfort in general of our society in talking about and dealing with sexualized violence and, you know, throughout the entire continuum, uh, people just are not comfortable dealing with this complexity because in some cases it's uh, normalizing you know, abuse that has been happening for a long, long time in, in, in different ways. And it's just a, you know, having a tool can be really helpful to create um, a system that can be shared and understood by all uh, to move those conversations forward. And you're reminding me that one of the pieces that we spoke about early on when we started the community of practice was, was also having a tool that allowed us to share some of those indicators and measures, because as it, it's probably evident, uh, we're all coming to this work from different starting points um, and with different kind of levels of evaluation experience. And currently it's really hard to kind of share what the data is telling us and to think through how we might understand that and work from that. So I think having a bit of a baseline that, that it's a tool that has some flexible indicators, but also some common indicators is gonna be really useful in that, in that work. My second question for you folks is, um, so a bit more of a practical question, given that, that many of us come to this work without the sort of experience grounded in evaluation frameworks. Um, we've all done lots of evaluation and we know what we want from evaluation, but we don't have that sort of experience uh, in developing and implementing the tools per se. How accessible have you found the tool so far? And do you, do you think it's accessible for other people who may not have that kind of experience? Um, so maybe I will connect in again, maybe I'll just start the same sort of round, Megan, if you want to start us off and other folks kind of jump in. For sure. And I think one of the strengths of the tool is that uh, we did have an evaluation expert, um, Anna, who, who created it for us. And so I think there can be some trust that that expertise was there in the development of the tool. Um, it also references a few uh, resources that people could look into on their own to learn more. But in, in terms of how accessible it is for maybe somebody who doesn't have evaluation experience, I'll say I do have some um, experience with research methods, with conducting research. So based off of that, I, I find it very accessible. At the same time, I think that if I didn't, one of the things that I've learned at my institution is um, just the resource in terms of collaboration. And I think if I didn't have that background and if I I think if I felt I found the tool daunting in any way, I might reach out to the people that I know within my campus, the people who are working in different departments, colleagues that are faculty or staff. If I have an institutional data analysis team on my campus, I, just connecting with those folks and then working with them to understand the tool and develop for our particular context. I think if that's possible, then that would help me out as well if I, if, if I found it um, challenging, but I do believe it's accessible. 
I suppose we're we're a bit biased because we've helped to create the tools. So hopefully we hopefully we find it accessible. Um, but I do appreciate the point then of having common language. The folks who maybe have the evaluation methods but are less in tune with the work around gender-based violence. So thanks for that point, Megan. Um, would other folks want to add anything into sort of how accessible or adaptable you think the tool might be? Um, I think that, uh, I mean, coming from people uh, who work frontline, this tool was created with that in mind with, you know, the needs that we have. Um, I, I think it, it is absolutely applicable and accessible to uh, the needs of frontline workers. Um, I know that especially uh, near the end of our project, we, we took some great thought to um, think about use and accessibility so people can refer to the simulation to kind of get a grasp of how the process might look like. Um, but yes, it certainly wasn't my, uh, I don't have a strong background in evaluation and I'm still really excited to um, apply it to my services, so. trying to make the evaluation. I know that evaluation and policy are some people's jam, um, but we're trying to make the, the excitement and the energy behind it <laughs> applicable to, to all of us. So um, I appreciate you adding in the piece about it, be, uh, still being excited about it. Um, and then also the piece about the simulation. So thanks, thanks again to Zainab for her instrumental work in that piece, because the simulation really then does help to showcase um, how you might use that, give a, give a guide or an example of how you might use that the data and the tools and the indicators. Um, so last question for folks. Um, so we've sort of talked a little bit about this and we have a question just in, in terms of recognizing all the things that we have to prioritize when we are trying to either the those of you who are doing this work sort of as frontline workers, um, Polly are coming into this work um, from community where there are many other things on the go. Um, Colleen, you kind of spoke about this is, is work that's kind of happening across a really vast space. So given that there are many things to prioritize, how do you think you'll be able to, to maybe use this kind of a tool to help prioritize evaluation? So maybe I will start with Colleen and then other folks can um, jump in. Thanks, Megan. So I see it as a, a great tool really to, you know, for a Yukon University to use as a, I would say, almost a new beginning because we have a lot of different individuals and new staff who are coming into this work, uh, who we don't have an office, but they will be expected to assist on that team. So this will be a great way to guide us as we create what Yukon University is now going to use uh, in conjunction with our community partners. So I, yeah, I, I am very excited that it is there uh, as something that we can pull and I anticipate that it will be really helpful in moving us along. Yeah, helpful to prioritize when, when you don't feel like you're starting from the beginning, when, you're, when you feel like you're starting with something. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Anyone else want to sort of jump into how you might use a tool like this to help prioritize given all of the other things that we have to prioritize? I'll jump in. Um, I think in a way it just makes it easy, like over the last, you know, few years that I've been in the position, I have de developed some of these tools and implemented some of them, but then got to a certain task that just was sort of daunting to me, so it kept being on the back burner, and I think the tool makes it easy to put it to the forefront and go, oh, here's a guide and here's a framework that I could just follow step by step and, and help me along through the process, and so I find that very helpful. Yeah, Paula. I think this tool um, really provides us with a foundation for opening those discussions about how we move this, this these positions forward. Um, both those that are currently there, we look at how we evaluate those in terms of improvements. And for those PSIs that still don't have these positions, it provides a great foundation for us to be able to say, look, here's some tools, here's some examples that you can start from. Um, so nobody's kind of starting at a left field or feeling like they're completely lost. 
which I think um, is a great note to to leave it on because as someone who did start in a university where that position never existed before, <laughs> I felt very lost. So anything that helps to reduce that isolation, I think is really important and anything that helps us feel like we are more prepared for the multiplicity of things that this work calls us to do, I think is really important. Um, so thank you for that that important piece to, to leave on. Um, and we will just say one more time, this is a really a working document. So you can tell we're pumped about it. Um, we're also really kind of biased about what this tool can do because we have long needed something like this in our work, but we see this as a tool that keeps going. And so we're really looking forward to the next phase with Courage to Act where folks are able to, um, you know, to adapt and develop this document as is gonna work for you and your context. So back to Courage to Act folks. That was such a great conversation. Thank you so much to the community of practice, the frontline GBV communities of practice, long name, but such an important group of people. Um, and I have so much respect for this group uh, as someone who does the frontline work as well. And as someone who's witnessed this group kindness and compassion with each other, I think there was a book club at some point that happened. I think there was, you know, there was a building of relationships that you really saw whenever you had the honor of being able to talk to this group. And I'm really excited when I'm hearing you too, because I think you know, one of the things that is named in the Courage Talk report and is named by so many frontline workers is the need for tools like this and the ability for the next two years for us to really look at this tool and refine it so that we can come up with things that really work for us. So I'm really excited about also the generative conversations that are going to come from this tool. I cannot thank this team enough for this. And we want to make sure that we're, you know, thanking this group for the work they're doing and also the folks that were adjacent to this group and supported this project are also a part of this project. So including um, Zanab, Anna, and Anu, thank you so much for all of the work that you did to make this happen, especially Anna um, did tremendous work and really sat down with a whole group of people, including myself, who had no idea all the time about evaluation the way she did and brilliant mind and so lucky to have her with the team at that time. Um, and we also, you know, you can see from Sam from Drawing Change has created a beautiful illustration to represent the conversation we've had today. A graphic recording from Drawing Change along with a video recording and transcript will be available on the website in the coming days. So look out for it. If you're interested in learning more about the tool or learning about the opportunity to pilot some of these tools, including this tool, because this is gonna be one of the pilot tools that we're doing for the next two years, please continue to follow the Courage to Act project. Um, you can sign up for piloting opportunities in uh, for, through our Knowledge Center in fall 2021. Um, and don't forget to register for our last session. I'm really excited about that one. I think it's a great thing to end our, our Skillshare on, which is with Vicki Reynolds. And it's an opportunity to talk about trauma exposure and how do we do this work with care, compassion, not only for ourselves, but for our peers. And I think that's something I really learned from the group, the community practice that brought this together. I was so impressed, which is the care and tenderness that they provided to each other and to members of the team. So make sure that you sign up for that one because I think Vicki Reynolds will bring us a lot of really interesting insights. And I also just want to thank all of you. You know, we've been having these for a year. This is not what we first thought of this project. We thought about, you know, all of us coming together physically, but it's been an amazing Skillshare time and really the breadth and depth of these conversations, the work of the community to practice, the time that you provided to push this conversation forward in meaningful ways is just so how it felt and tremendous and cannot thank you enough for that. Um, we're really lucky to learn, work and play sometimes creatively um, alongside all of you. And we cannot thank you enough for the hard work that you're doing around this project. And this project would not be here without all that work. We also wanna thank WAGE for their tremendous support of this project for the past three year and the government of Canada, of course. Thank you for joining us and a kind reminder to do some self care, take a breath, take a stretch and fill out those evaluation forms. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone.